Okay, so this is the beginning of our lectures which take a journey through the information processing model and illustrate how it helps us to understand how uh, we produce motor movements and how we learn new motor movements. It is uh, a theory, a metaphor, for how this production occurs, uh, which was inspired by the kind of onset of computing in the 50s uh, and our increasing awareness of how really to unpack what goes on in some kind of um, black box phenomenon is what led us to start treating the brain the same way. So I may have used the phrase black box in previous talks and the idea is that well, we can see what goes in and something happens inside and then a response comes out and we can see that but we have to make inferences about what's happening inside. So we make some logical guesses about what needs to happen in order for that movement to take place and then we start changing the stimuli and introducing different conditions and then seeing what differences in the outputs are produced and it should start to steer us towards what's happening inside this um, again they use the word black box but actually of course it's grey mush and that's equally unhelpful we can't really tell by looking at it what's going on we can't easily tell uh, from scanning it exactly what the contents of those thoughts are. We just know that there's some work being done in an area. It could be uh, excitation or inhibition, it could be supporting information or the main information. So the scans and looking don't really help us that much. We have to kind of somehow translate this black box phenomenon so we can see what goes in, make inferences about what's happening inside and then see what comes out. And that is termed the information processing perspective. It's explained in most of the major handbooks and textbooks so we're not uh, going off down the wrong track however you should be aware that there are clear instances where you can see that as a metaphor or a descriptive theory it falls down and it actually it gives a poor representation of the way our brain works as opposed to how computers traditionally have worked so we're just going to scan through some basic principles and relate them to the information processing model and again that model is going to underpin the next few lectures in this uh, unit and then we're going to focus on the first stage of the model which is where these inputs reach the system and are somehow encoded into the system so that involves some kind of sensation and perception and we're going to explore how uh, our visual system alone even though there's also touch and taste and all the rest just the visual system operates and how we can again change the inputs and that informs us about how it's working and that should allow us just to look at a little, little insight into how perception informs the motor learning process so as explained we have this big problem whereby we can see what's going in and in natural circumstances that's not under our control it's just what happens in the real world but we need to somehow work out what's happening inside this impenetrable black box and you know if you do happen to open up a brain and look at what's going on you've probably already broken it so that's no good we need to somehow without damaging it understand what's what's happening inside and even you know things which can be very informative like if you manage to insert a tiny electrode and measure the activity of one neuron enormously intrusive and potentially very painful um, and just disruptive to the person who has to undergo that procedure and the amount of information you get can be quite um, limited sometimes so at the moment the best thing we can do is to do experiments whereby we have a guiding theory we, it makes predictions and we're able to test those predictions against what actually happens. So we could, for example, look at just simple things like reaction time. We could uh, do little clever things with the inputs and see if that affects the quality of the movements. There's lots of options available and really this model gives us a foothold in, in just attempting to access these concepts and formulate our tests. And that's how knowledge is generated. We have a theory, it makes predictions, we test those predictions, and the ones that survive constant testing start to become more accepted, and the ones that fail, eventually we decide they must be wrong after all. So here's the kind of very simplistic overview, which we'll break down as we progress through. There is 
input from the environment and as I said most of the time that's whatever happens to be going on whatever the task demands are whatever terrain you happen to be traversing at the time and then something happens that input is fed into a machine the machine performs some operations which we don't know what they are and an output occurs and we have to infer guess what is happening inside that system and our first instinct is to say well what jobs does that system need to do to get from sensory inputs to a sensible output and then let's look for those things and let's see if we can uh, modify or influence those things by changing the inputs so that's the key and of course what we should be able to do as we progress and as our theory improves is actually understand that what we thought ought to happen maybe not what's actually happening and so we should be able to constantly modify our theory as our experiments start to prove us wrong. So as I mentioned there's the naturally occurring environment in which case whatever is influencing you is just whatever happens to be naturally there, the task you've engaged in, the uh, environment that that happens to be taking place in and we'd probably call that the open environment but then when we need to influence things and actually control the inputs we could create an artificial environment where for example we fix as many of the variables as possible so that they never change and the only thing that's changing is what we want to influence and that way we should be able to infer that whatever caused the change to our system and whatever caused that difference in output was a result of our manipulation and those things can vary by degree so sometimes you can introduce more and more uh, variables from an artificial environment until it ends up looking a lot like a more natural open environment uh, and traditionally lab tests will be very artificial and field tests will be very much more open the problem is by stripping away the number of variables and the number of influences we start to look less and less like reality and so you would call that lacking contextual validity which is important because if you end up with a situation which could never happen in real life it starts to mean well then how useful is it to know that information that emerged from that experiment so we have to qualify at the very least we have to qualify our claims and say in very controlled conditions that only this thing changes then we get that result but of course that probably doesn't reflect real life so the first iteration the first thing that makes sense is to say there's some sort of stimulus identification where the information is fed into the system and you're somehow coding what's being perceived and making sense of it then in relation to the stimuli and the demands being placed upon us we choose a most appropriate response and then of course we have to program that response and produce it somehow and that of course isn't easy and that requires some work and it's dependent on the preceding stages so if any of those are done incorrectly or there's an error somewhere then the program itself will be wrong and the eventual output will be non-optimal When we focus on the first stage, traditionally most people just imagine there are five senses vision, sound, touch, smell, balance, but there are many more in fact. Um, we should be able to think about uh, the accelerations of our body as being a sense, the stretch of tendons, we have the very acute senses of hunger and thirst and how hot or cold we are which is probably separate from touch because we can sense it internally as well. Different estimates vary, but there could be up to 50 senses, depending what you count as being different or the same. And that's really important. And I've, I've missed taste off there as well, which of course is a, a classic sense. So it's really important that if you only learn one thing off this slide, there's many more than just five senses. And please, we need to move on from thinking about things like that. We're going to focus in the following few slides on just vision, just to give you an idea of how we can manipulate the inputs and do little tricks that actually are informative about what's happening and and different from what we would program a computer to do. You know, if we went in with a blank slate and designed something, it probably wouldn't operate in the same way that our visual system operates. And the same probably applies to sound and touch and smell. And also vision seems one of the most relevant senses to consider in relation to movement. Before we get too far into this, it's just worth pausing to 
consider the assumptions of our model because most theories and models have an assumption underlying them and those, if they were wrong, would ruin everything. So we assume that these stages occur between the stimulus entering the system and the response being produced. Yeah, this, the assumptions might make sense, but if we happen to find that something's wrong, then that would be a problem. The stimulus initiates the process, which of course may not always be true. There might be movements which are produced before we get some kind of go signal or some kind of stimulus. We assume that information is passed directly from each stage to the next, so that it's in, you know, it, like I said a minute ago, it, the output or the response programming is dependent on the information received from the other stages, which again might be flawed. There might be uh, stages taking place in the wrong order. There might be information already held in the system which isn't actually being passed on from stage to stage. Memory, for example, we'd have to add that in, and that would perhaps be a a caveat to our, our assumptions. We assume that the information is transformed at each stage and therefore the information you could uh, observe coming from each stage of the process would be different uh, and then we assume that also takes time and that contributes to the reaction time components in our measures. And we assume that only the transformed information is what's available to the next stage, so not information from the sensing is available at the programming stage because the transformations have occurred in between and it's now different. So that's important to know because it's a core principle underlying the model and it's based on the sort of computing metaphor and as I say you'll probably see instances of that breaking and just failing slightly as we go through and that should suggest to us that the information processing model is just a model, a heuristic, a rule of thumb, and not a true fact, as I hope you're understanding that most theories are not 100% true, they just help us to engage with the topic and understand it and study it. So this is a kind of a, a slightly more opened up model and it will guide our lectures as we progress through, focusing today on sensation and perception. And then we'll have separate talks on the response selection and programming stage and the roles of important factors like attention and memory. All just supplementing this model of, of how information is being processed, all trying to follow the assumptions outlined in the previous slide, but I'll try and signpost where those assumptions may start to look a bit shaky. So focusing on that first stage, we have our traditional senses. We have at least proprioception, which is more than just uh, Golgi tendons and muscle spindles, but also uh, lots of different internal senses, even down to baroreceptors measuring sort of an indication of blood pressure and intrathoracic pressure. So really important that we're aware there are many senses being taken up various different time points, all the time really and it's possible to train yourself to become more aware of those and less focused on um, you know for example less focused on pain in in prolonged endurance events and perhaps focus on something else that's more informative and less likely to make you stop so it's, it's possible to learn to pay attention differently so this first stage of trying to detect signals accurately and if you can't detect signals accurately, then you've got a problem straight away. So obviously a big problem with vision would significantly uh, affect your ability to, to participate in different sports and different movements. And the same if you have uh, different types of disability that affect your um, sensing of movement or your ability to encode movements. Uh, but certainly anyone who's, able, who's not able to see or understand uh, movement demands would be in a bad shape straight away. But even in a fully functional, you know, normal system, there are ways of exposing issues and problems that I'm about to go through. And those uh, inform us about how the system is working. And really they show us how we're kind of being uh, given a false sense of security in some ways, that what we think, you know, we think we see the world accurately, and actually there are a few assumptions and problems being made, are being allowed to, pass under the surface. 
So there's the initial impact of the information on our senses, and then that information is perceived, and the environment of stimuli is somehow interpreted. So the important things are selected out, and then what's got through that test is then interpreted and actually um, given meaning. And you know, the example often is that you'll be sat or standing wherever you are now, probably ignoring this, the signals coming from the clothes on your skin or the air temperature and all these different things just completely not being attended to, but they're actually being sensed and that information is just immediately ignored or you know put down the, the pile of priorities. But it is of course possible to bring them to attention and not only that but you could perhaps be perceiving in terms of giving them some additional meaning. So not just sensing the kind of basic stimulus but interpreting it slightly. So that's there's a difference, I think, between what is sensed, the basic stimuli, and then when it reaches the brain, there's this kind of interpretation and piecing together of different types of information and different sources of information. And those are then encoded, and it all starts to be more meaningful. So what that means is we pay attention, and that affects what we perceive. And there's also this important role whereby we're constantly comparing what's being identified to memory. So we can manage the expectations, we can give people focus on different memories for example, and that influences perception. It shouldn't really influence the basic sensation process, which is very important difference to make, to, to draw. So there's a basic detection and then there's some kind of comparison to whatever stored in memory and that should usually give us some sense of recognition. And it could be that we're very familiar, or it could be that we're loosely familiar with something, but there's this sense of recognition and that begins to guide our movements. Either I know what I'm doing or I can piece together something that will work. And that's the basic idea. But perception is much more than just sense, and perception is when we start to piece together all the very basic uh, pieces of information and stitch together this uh, canvas of you know, this representation of what's going on. And so the following few slides should just show you how that information is being encoded and there are assumptions and there are issues with that and might even leave you feeling quite impressed that we're able to experience the world as if it's as if we're getting 2020 perfect um, you know colored TV when actually that's not how our perceptual system works at all. So the very first stage is the visual perception and that we call that the, the hardware really the well yeah where we have this sensing aspect that's very much hardware whether it be quality of the cornea in the lens whether it be the quality of the liquid in the eye the retina these are very much hardware properties but they do influence our ability to, to subsequently perceive so if you need glasses if and people vary in their ability to judge different shades of colour, for example, people vary in their ability to focus and refocus quickly. Uh, people we know have differences in depth perception, so it's not just about wearing glasses either. Of course, there's um, colour blindness as well. Some of those things are extremely hard to train, and therefore, casting our minds back to our previous lecture on whether we'd call them skills or abilities, the chances are those are hardware properties, their abilities, they don't respond to training. The only changes you get will be as a result of aging, I imagine, or, or damage. And then hopefully you can undo that by um, correcting it with glasses or treatment. So the software would be how that information is processed. And you can imagine a computer with um, a set of senses, sensors pointing out into the world and you could program different software to interpret those, those sensors differently and that's really where we get into the perception component of software. And it, we're just referring here to pattern recognition and perhaps pattern recall from previous experiences. And straight away we can see these really interesting examples of this top-down process. So no sooner is the information in the system than memory and experience, so things that are already existing in the system and unique to the person are actually influencing the way the information is being encoded at a very early stage. So even something as simple as uh, 
um, chess, which is quite nice and controllable. If we have experts versus quite good players, and just test their ability to memorize uh, positions on the board, we could see that the experts were able, were very able, better able to memorize where the pieces were. So long as those uh, figurations of, of pieces were possible within a real game. And that's really interesting. So basically they had a better understanding and a better ability to perceive and encode and memorize where the pieces were, so long as it could actually happen. If it wasn't at all realistic, it didn't trigger any recognition, any recall, and they were just as, as bad, if that's the right word, just as bad as the average players. So that points to software. There's no difference in the player's ability to, to see and sense, but the way the information was subsequently encoded as a result of experience was different. Another example, very similar, except using soccer players, experienced versus inexperienced, trying to um, memorize positions on a pitch on a, as they're playing. And the same effect occurred whereby the experts were able to memorize and recall the positions that they'd observed in this either video or photo better. They were encoding it better so long as it was possible in real life. Otherwise, they were as bad as the novices again. So it's very specific to the sport and very dependent on experience and so what we're saying is the level of experience you've got actually affects your ability to encode and recall and perceive therefore the figurations. So it's not just you're observing what's there, at the very early stage you're interpreting it, a very early stage indeed. So here's an example of interpretation affecting what you see. Uh, on the left hand side we've got a picture which could either be a duck facing to the left or a cartoon rabbit facing to the right. And it depends what you look for as to what you see. And interestingly it's very hard to see both at the same time. You either see a duck or you see a rabbit. There's very little overlap. On the second picture most people will see uh, I guess two people hunched over a table with a, a vase in the middle and very high-backed chairs. However, if you're told to look for a cat's face, of course, that's what you see. And once again, really, really hard to see both at the same time. Just skip to the right-hand side for another example. Uh, and again, it's either a duck's head facing to the left or a rabbit's head facing to the right. And once again, it's very difficult to see both. And it depends what you're looking for. If you actively look for a duck, you see a duck, if you look for a rabbit, you see a rabbit. And that's been termed a gestalt switch because it was discovered by a group uh, of psychologists who named it that. And they all worked on a gestalt theory for a while. But it's an example of how you're not seeing what's objectively there, you're seeing what you're told to look for. In the third picture, uh, which appears to be just black and white dots, many people struggle to see anything at all until you're told to look for a dog sniffing the ground. And it's a Dalmatian dog, so it's very spotty, and its head's just down to the ground, roughly in the middle. It's walking away from us, but most of the time, when you're told to look for it, suddenly it becomes clear. So again, our it's a top-down process, not a bottom-up process, whereby the information just somehow self-organises. We're actively influencing the processing of the information as it enters our system. Another example of a little trick here is uh, most people will perceive that this diagram is moving even though I can promise you it's not and in fact you'll have the slide so you can go and see that it's just a, a still picture not a video. But it's a function of the way that our eyes move around so we actually take samples from all over our visual field all the time and the way this one's arranged as we're scanning around the picture it starts to give us the illusion that it's moving slightly. And it's just because we're using very basic colours and the particular organisation of these blocks, but it starts to fool us into thinking that perhaps this is moving. And that's another illustrative example of just how we're not seeing the world for how it is, a still picture. We're sampling and we're doing things which are breakable and are fallible. 
But again, most of us will believe that we are seeing the world exactly as it is until such time as we are confronted by little illusions like this. Another example is uh, how we perceive straight lines. Very simplistic diagram here, but once again, I can promise you that all these lines are straight, and then if you want to, you can go to the slides and draw a straight line yourself and, and put it across and you'll see that they are straight lines. But it's a very convincing illusion. And it's just another example of the way that we sample the world. We aren't actually looking at straight lines, we're influenced by what's around them and, and just the especially as you can tell here, the corners are very important to our visual system. So if you mess with the corners and just put other little dots in there, it really affects what we're seeing. And suddenly, we don't see these perfectly straight lines, we, we see this kind of curved pattern. And again, our system has, has evolved to be sensitive to straight lines, but also to try and force patterns where there aren't any. So sometimes we'll actually start to see a, a nice kind of um, circular pattern almost, as if something's rested there and now it's gone. And that's another example of just how our brain is attempting to force a pattern when it isn't there, it's just straight lines. Similar here, uh, it's just a, a little visual shortcut that we use whereby we expect things that are straight lines to be lined up, and if they're not then we start to assume they must not be straight after all. But you're welcome to go and get the ruler out and, and measure this and you'll see that the lines are completely straight. But that slight lack of alignment between the black and white squares really casts doubt because we're very sensitive visually uh, to the straight lines and corners and in particular to transitions between clear, clear lines. I mean, corners and edges are very important to how we perceive things. That's normally where something concrete or something in a uh, solid stops and some clear spaces. So it's really important that we perceive straight lines well. What that means is we actually tend to take these shortcuts which can be exposed using these illusions. I'll come back to the straight lines well in a second, but just while we're at it, another really convincing uh, illusion is that which of these two balls is bigger. And once again, I can promise you that they are exactly the same size. They'll be making the same uh, size of image on the back of your retina, you can actually, when you go to the PowerPoint slide, you can actually grab that template circle from the bottom right hand corner and overlay it across the two and they are identical in size. However, this is a good example of a, a shortcut that our brain uses whereby if something appears to be further away, in this case just using perspective, then we infer that it must be bigger. Um, because we're used to operating in three-dimensional space, not two-dimensional space. And it's really convincing, and we look at that and we feel that the one at the top must be genuinely bigger, even if we're asked to say in two dimensions, is it bigger? But it's not. It's the same size of the image, and we're just being fooled because we're used to taking shortcuts. So here's a back to the straight lines phenomenon. Edges are extremely important to us. They represent uh, a transition between something solid and the space that we can actually move through. Exceptionally important across all species in evolution. And the question is, are there, in fact, grey dots in this diagram between the squares, or are we being fooled? It's a very strong illusion, very powerful illusion. There are no grey dots, and again, you can open up the PowerPoint slide and look that it's just a, a simple picture, nothing funny going on. But what it's demonstrating is that our visual system is so sensitised to straight lines and edges that what it does is it actually boosts the signal. And it actually says to the neurons that are detecting an edge, the guys who are, for example, seeing white, you speak louder, and the guys who are seeing black, you stay quiet. You, it suppresses those signals. But of course, here, where we've got these blending edges. These are straight lines and our visual system is organised in circular patterns so that it's all uh, you know looking for here's the centre of the uh, signal and, and then it falls away. That's just how our retina is organised obviously into clusters. So if we combat those two systems, straight lines versus a nice kind of looking for circular architecture, we get this problem. So we get this dampening down of, of some of the uh, cells 
that should be telling us to look for white, but they're actually being told to go quiet because they're right next to cells that should be seeing or are seeing black. So they're being told to stay quiet and not not signal. Maybe that's not the best explanation. I'll try to do my best there. You can read further if you like, but it's another example of how we're so sensitive to edges that our brain and our visual system takes this shortcut. And that's informative about how, for example, we might subsequently be making mistakes when producing movements. Another example, um, less difficult, less challenging this time, is, is whether these two towers are in fact the same picture or not. Most of us will look at the right hand side of that screen and say that's a different picture, it's somehow more leaning. Again, you're welcome to uh, you know, open up the PowerPoint and just draw a line on the left hand side, take it across to the right hand side. It's this, exactly the same picture, but we kind of expect this circular pattern to emerge. It's just a, an expectation, something we're used to perceiving, and therefore it's extremely compelling. We just look at no matter how long we look at it, we still think it is a different picture. So, on the one hand, we have this visual system which uses cells, and in fact all of our perception uses some kind of signal cells to detect information in the world. Almost as soon as it's been detected, it's being influenced, and assumptions creep in, and shortcuts creep in, but also expectations creep in, and we can guide ourselves to see things that aren't there. A classic example for most of us will be seeing you know, monsters or hearing things that go bump in the night when we're kids, they're not there, but if we expect to see them, if we're scared about them, it's all you can see. So it's a very fallible system, and by observing how it can sometimes fail, starts to show us the nature of the inside of that black box, this magical thing that happens. We can, you know, just changing those inputs ever so slightly, we can see that some shortcuts are being taken, and it's not exactly the same as a computer, for example. Sometimes we can actually base our training and practice on those systems and we can be informed by knowing that some aspects of the sensing or some aspects of the encoding process need to be trained and enhanced or um, expectations need to be managed differently. Um, so one thing you can, I've heard people do is, is actually telling, for example, a batsman in cricket what to look for and to try and ignore the extraneous stuff. Same in tennis. What exactly do you need to know here? Where should you focus your attention? Ignore everything else. So actually, that tells us that we should perhaps be thinking about attention and, and directing attention, and perhaps, yeah, using our scientific knowledge to improve or manage attention. That could be a useful way of maximizing the sensation process and the perceiving process, making it work better for us. So even at the sensation and perception stage, there's some interesting things going on, and we can steer those. And of course, if there are, if there is damage to those systems, then that would completely change how we taught someone. So if, for example, you choose to do your intervention on a population which has damage to the visual system or damage to the sensing system, the whole rest of what you do would be very different compared to if it was uh, a healthy population. And that's really important to be able to contextualise that and put it into words very clearly on a page so that any reader can understand exactly what you're doing and what you're thinking. So in future we're going to go into looking at decision making and how that influences the ultimate output to the system. But for now it's just this illustration of how a simple model, a simple heuristic, allows us to break down this system to keep some aspects of it constant and to just change the things that we want to change. And that informs us about what's going on inside that black box. So this is the next lecture, hopefully, and I'm hoping this has been informative and useful for you, just to show how we studied this in the past. So if we briefly summarise our coverage of sensing and perception, the nature of the environment and the way the system interprets that environment is a core factor in motor performance and in motor learning or skill acquisition. And the stimulus identification is, is a core part, it's that first stage where the information hits the system and one core lesson from today is that it's very early on that differences occur as a result of memory and experience, um, 
So there's a software differences as well as a hardware differences in terms of how good your eyes are or how good your how many sensors you have, for example, for detection. So the perception phase is, is that bit beyond just sensing in terms of how the information is analyzed and interpreted and, and stitched together into a coherent experience. And one important point is that you can actually improve the perception as a result of experience. So people will become better at encoding information through experience, people will become better able to remember information and, and better able to know what to look for as a result of experience. So that's a really important point. We aren't simply observing what's there naturally in a totally objective sense. At a very early stage, these influences of experience and training can play a role. So we have our core chapters about this in uh, both Schmidt and Risberg and Schmidt and Lee. Whichever one you happen to look for, it's just a flip to the back, find the section on information processing and it's very easy to proceed from there. As I said before, I think the books tend to be quite similar in their coverage. Even if you look at different editions, it's not a big problem. Uh, but for now, we're introduced to the concept and we've looked at the sensing part of the process. So we'll keep exploring from here on in.